find my piece of the pie, a dignified life. Farm worker immigration issues for more than 30 years. She was a founder and member of the Brockport Ecumenical Outreach Committee to serve farm worker families in Brockport. And she's worked as a teacher advocate with the Brockport Migrant Educational Outreach Program. She was a staff member of the Presbyterian Board of Ministry Frontera de Cristo in Mexico on the steering committee of Rockla. Um, no, she is, yes, steering committee of Rockla, but also the, uh, the steering committee of the um, New Sanctuary Coalition in New York City. And she holds a PhD in American and Latin American history from the City University of New York, and she's fluent in Spanish. Thank you, Grania. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing, um, especially for the younger people here, and that is today, tonight, is the 50th anniversary of the War on Poverty. You don't know very, I see folks sort of similar to my age, and then some younger folks. So if you don't know about that, you need to know that in fact the War on Poverty, many of the programs were successful. This narrative that's coming out now about that it's a failure is wrong. And this isn't related to immigration necessarily, but I just want everybody to have that on their mind. So if you read about the war on poverty, and it comes from a politician of some sort, you have to take it with a grain of salt when they say it was a failure, because there's a lot more to the history than is talked about in the media today. OK. Um, this, uh, first of all, I have a, a fair number of handouts, but I may not have enough for everybody. And so um, if you want something that is disappearing, I have everything as an electronic file. And so I can send, if you give me your email address, I probably should have a sign up sheet, which I don't. But maybe um, Gail could find something to turn into a sign up sheet. Okay, um, I do also have a text version of the slides, and uh, that's so you can look at some of the factual information. I have left off all of the citations for the slides, for the fact, factual information in the slides, mainly to save room. So again, if you're interested in finding out where something comes from, um, you can ask me and I'll send you. Okay? Um, this, this talk really comes out of my own personal journey with immigration. Um, I, have, I lived in Mexico um, for a as a child, and my dad was born in Mexico, although he was the child of Americans in Mexico. But he was a completely bilingual, and because he had a love for Mexico and the Mexican people, we spent quite a bit of time there when I was a child. So I have a, um, you know, a personal connection, but it's also sort of a um, documenting, in a way, my own journey, because I've learned as I, I was like a lot of you all who, you know, think legislative sh solutions and have spent many hours writing letters and lobbying Congress people and all that kind of thing. And I guess where I've come to now is not that that's completely useless, but that it's very limited in what you can do. So I think you could say I've really been radicalized by my experience with immigrants, working with immigrants, particularly um, on the border in Mexico and in New York City. Um, things are not what they seem to be often, just as the latest immigration um, bill, which looks like it won't go anywhere anyway, um, is really not a solution. 
So I know there are people who will disagree with me, but just so you know kind of where I'm coming from. Okay. This is just um, the context. Um, just that we have a whole immigrant history in this country, and really the patterns are the have been the same over our whole history. People come because they're looking for um, a, a, an opportunity. They're trying to um, escape persecution or economic injustice or poverty or a whole host of other things. And they come here and often young men are the first ones in a family to emigrate. But they become um, kind of the magnet. They get involved in the communities of people of similar ethnic origin. They join groups. They form mutual aid societies. And then more people come and gradually families start, start to come. Um, we also have in our history, we have that, that welcoming on the one hand, but we also have a whole history of really virulent anti-immigrant um, fever at certain times in our history. And uh, the notable examples of that are no Irish need apply. Um, it, it's racial as well, but it's also all um, I would say peasant or poor people coming. So no Irish need apply. This is a cartoon of a, a person from China at the time of the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, which was our first really serious legislation that excluded a certain immigrant group. And um, so these nativist groups tend to tend to grow at times of economic difficulty here, at times of depression, uh, and em immigrants at those times tend to be scapegoated. The same things you hear today about losing, they're taking our jobs, they're ruining our economy, uh, etc. Uh, and then one other thing there is that labor unions, interestingly enough, until relatively recently, um, were anti-immigrant and supported that, that sort of line of narrative. Um, you hear, I'm gonna, going to go fairly quickly through these because you can sort of read this, but um, you hear these are the 10 most common myths you hear all you need to do is turn on your television and this is what you hear. My ancestors came here legally. The fact is there was no legal or illegal. Unless you were a pauper or a prostitute or um, some other quote undesirable person which or had a low quote loathsome disease, you were not, you could come here. So there was nothing similar to what we have now. We are being invaded by immigrants. Yes, in the last um, 20 years, particularly from um, 1995 to 2005, there was a huge upsurge in immigration. I'll talk about a little bit later what that, why that was. But um, as a proportion of the population, there are actually fewer immigrants now than there were um, at the turn of the century. Immigrants take our jobs. I know you've heard this one. Um, basically, the, the hugest amount of immigration came at a time of prosperity in the U.S. It was before, until before the recession. And now, um, the immigrants are not coming. Immigration is actually at net zero now in terms of um, people being deported versus people coming in. So the, the big surge came in that period from 95 to 2005. Immigrants don't want to learn English and um, immigrants bring crime. Neither of these are true, but um, within 10 years of arrival, most immigrants want to uh, do speak English their children always learn to speak English, 
and there's actually a great demand for ESL or English as a second language classes, which is actually unmet. Uh, and then the, the crime rates comparing native-born um, Americans to immigrants. Native-born Americans commit crimes at a greater rate than immigrants do. This is actually um, a chart that you probably will not be able to read, but I, I think you get the idea. This is Im immigrants should just go to the back of the line like my ancestors did. That's actually not possible because there really is no line and uh, unless you're a highly trained worker in some field that we need or you're um, escaping political perse persecution and have a credible fear of persecution or death, or which means you're applying for asylum, or you're joining immediate family already here. Not cousins, not um, aunts, uncles, immediate nuclear family. So this just gives you an idea of, it says what part of legal immigration don't you understand? And really what it shows is how many ways the door is shut for most of the immigrants, particularly people that are poor, um, or as they call them, low-skilled. Most uh, immigrants, myth seven, most immigrants cross the border illegally. Again, not true. Uh, Forty-odd percent, I, I have it here, 45 percent um, entered the country legally and then overstayed their visa. Immigrants don't pay taxes. Again, if you're talking about um, income taxes, it's more true than for any other kind, but many immigrants actually pay income taxes as well. But they also pay so social security taxes, which they will never receive. Um, and they pay um, sales tax because everybody pays sales tax. So they actually pay a large number of taxes. Immigrants come here to take benefits they don't deserve. This is another one. I used to hear a lot when I worked in Mexico and I would go across the border to Arizona uh, quite a lot for meetings and such. Um, they, they will not be able to receive benefits under the Affordable Care Act. They will not be able to receive Social Security under the current immigration, so-called reform legislation, if it happens. Um, they can use um, hospitals as emergency rooms, but they otherwise aren't entitled to TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, what people call welfare and they're not eligible for Medicaid. Anyone who enters the U.S. illegally is a criminal who's broken the law. Again, you hear this narrative constantly. And actually, um, entering without inspection is kind of the equivalent of trespassing. And so, What's happened, and I'll talk more about the laws that have come along and what's happening in our country in the last, uh, certainly in the last uh, five years since Obama, but under Bush as well. It's just gotten really worse every year in terms of enforcement. So the one thing that does criminalize immigrants who otherwise have done nothing but enter without inspection, which is a civil offense, is Operation Streamline, which um, went into, was, was a pilot program started in, in uh, Arizona, and basically it's a sort of mass uh, pre uh, court proceeding where they take a whole bunch of people who have been caught out in the desert or wh wherever at the border and make them plead guilty to a, an offense that's a criminal offense. 
And so then they have a criminal record and they can be included in uh, those categories of immigrants. Uh, and I'll talk more about this later, but categories of Im immigrants that we are deporting because they're, quote, criminals. This just gives you an idea of the history of immigration from 1880. So this is, these are the numbers. So as you can see, these are the greatest numbers we've ever had, um, but they're not the greatest proportion. The actual highest proportion of the population came in um, 1900 to 1910, I think it is. Okay, here's where we start to um, get to where we, the path to where we are now. Um, the Bracero program, which was a program started by the US government after World War II, um, during and after it was actually 1942 when it started, to replace the workers, millions of workers who were fighting World War II. And mostly, you know, we were, gen we were more of an agricultural country then, so a lot of people um, were agricultural workers before they went into the army. So you have the Braceros who came who were, um, it's kind of an estimate, but still somewhere around four and a half million workers. Bracero comes from the word braza, which is arms. Um, and they were arms for American, mostly for American farmers, although in some other um, categories. The program um, really ripped off uh, a lot of workers in Mexico. And in fact, there are Mexican families of Mexican workers who are still seeking the wages that their fathers and grandfathers earned at the time of the Bracero program, but were never paid. They were also uh, not only not paid a lot, but not mostly, many of them did not have any kind of housing, so they slept outside. Um, there were uh, tremendous abuses, and those of you who are like my age or older um, probably saw a Harvest of Shame, which was the documentary that exposed um, the, this, these abuses. The program ended because there was just a hue and cry among Congress people and public and everybody against the program. However, the Bracero program did set up a, um, a, a kind of situation where you had contract, a contractor system, um, you had um, people in Mexico who were part of that contractor system. So you had um, a, a kind of a, um, I think the, uh, the word is um, infrastructure still existing for people to leave Mexico to work in the U.S. and then come back. Um, that tri traditional migration pattern has continued since then. It's now very different, but up until the big crackdown on immigration in the mid-90s, um, the traditional migration pattern was leave Mexico, go and work in California, New York, Michigan, North Carolina, some of the big states, agricultural states, and then return to Mexico and use your, the funds you had, you had earned to build a house to make, uh, uh, help support your children's education. Um, next. And then there were uh, U.S. actions that also increased immigration. Not, not, it's, this is not, you do not hear about this on the part of politicians. They don't talk about what we did. Um, they talk about people trying to take advantage of our system. But we did some notable things. One was the Border Industrialization Act, which was enacted in 1964 after the end of the Bracero program, because Mexico was concerned with a lot of dislocated workers in northern Mexico who, because of the end of the Bracero program, had no jobs. 
and they had all, you know, they were there. So they, um, the Border Industrialization Program um, provide, was a free trade zone along the border where foreign factories, which almost all were American, but not 100% American, set up um, assembly plants, basically, where they could pay Mexican workers relatively low wages, like $5 a day was a good wage, um, to do things like assemble our cars, to do electronics, um, clothing, um, but all assembly kind of work. That, was, that provided jobs, uh, particularly for women and low-wage women. There were a lot of abuses in the system, and I won't go into the details, but in any case, in the, starting in the mid-90s, um, many of those factories went to Asia because it became cheaper to do those same things in Thailand and Malaysia and China, of course, and some other places, um, Singapore. So those jobs disappeared and you had, you still had um, dislocated, or you had a new crop of dislocated workers. Because what happened with those factories encouraged the poor states, which included Chiapas and Oaxaca, Veracruz and Puebla especially, became the sending states. And their first stop was, for a lot of them, were the Maquilas. When they shut down, these people had no work, so they crossed the border to get jobs when they couldn't find jobs in Mexico. And then there were the wars in El Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua in the 80s. Again, hundreds of thousands of people migrated to the U.S. as a result of those. Um, our first Immigration Control Act was called um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 under Reagan. The interesting thing about this was it did actually grant um, a path to citizenship, uh, what they quote call amnesty now, to uh, 3.5, no, I'm sorry, 2.5, 2.7, there are there are different exact numbers, but up to 3 million um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants. So for those who had been in the country for five years and had worked particularly in agriculture, this was a big, a big improvement. The negative side of IRCA, as it's called, is that it established employer sanctions. So it was the beginning of interior ways of controlling immigration by uh, sanctioning employers who hired undocumented people. Um, the problem with that was it, um, it was, it didn't really work. And I think there really wasn't that, you know, maybe once a year or so they'd raid a couple of farms or something up here. But basically it wasn't really enforced to a great degree. Because the business community liked it, obviously. Um, the, the other piece of that that becomes more and more important is the H-2A program, which is the guest worker program for farm workers and other I believe landscapers, um, mostly H2B is, is higher, um, high, so-called higher skilled workers, H2A are the so-called lower skilled, mostly in agriculture but in other fields. And H2A really, um, the farmers didn't like it because it is cumbersome and difficult and a pain in the neck. and. The workers basically could be exploited because they were stuck with whoever brought them to work. So if you didn't provide housing, and we had cases right here in western New York where the folks would be brought up and then housed in a barn or something with children and you know families. Um, so it was really, it, it's, it's just bad all around. Unfortunately, H-2A has become something we more and more rely on. Um, 
then end up, but undocumented immigration grew anyway because these were kind of prosperous years, relatively speaking, in the U.S. Next. So this is the growth of the H-2A program, which you can see. And I do have a handout here that's a, a statement made by um, one of the lawyers at the um, Worker Justice Center of New York that testified on the problems with guest worker programs, so you can read that. Okay, then we have 1994. And three things that happened then. One was the coffee stabilization agreement, which was the U.S. and a bunch of coffee producing countries, including those in Mexico and Central America, um, we began stabilizing prices after World War II and guaranteeing a certain floor in coffee prices. And these were coffee producing countries. And that enabled farmers there to, we, um, to have a sort of basic floor under the price of coffee, which was their livelihood. We did that not out of altruism, but to keep communism out of Central America. And this came about at a time when, you know, that was the U.S.'s biggest fear. Um, the second thing was NAFTA. And NAFTA, um, oh, let me just add, the coffee, when the coffee stabilization agreement ended, the price of coffee nosedived. And so people, for the country, the one I know the most about is Mexico, but in, in Chiapas, for example, people were getting one-fifth of what they had gotten before for their coffee. So basically, it destroyed the livelihoods of literally millions of coffee growers in Mexico and elsewhere. Um, then NAFTA came along. And NAFTA, as most of you already know, has been a, a disaster both for Mexico and the U.S. And no one should tell you differently. Um, it, uh, I will focus on Mexico because that's what we're talking about today, the drivers for immigration. But basically, uh, Mexico it was supposed to be a job producer for Mexico. And while it has supported some employment in, in the sort of more industrial sector, it destroyed agriculture um, as a livelihood in Mexico. And it also um, destroyed um, small business that was basically small town, small business serving folks who, who were mostly farmers. Um, it, um, and then there was the de devaluation of the peso, and the reasons for that are pretty complex, so I'm not going to go into the details. But all of that happened in 1994. So the results of NAFTA, as I said, it destroyed agricultural production. The reason for that was NAFTA required Mexico, and, and you should know, it, these trade agreements aren't negotiated by Joe Schmo. They're negotiated by the elites of any country. So in, in Mexico, it was the large landowners, um, you know, the telecom company, the, those, those people who are wealthy. And they're a teeny percentage of the population. And so it required Mexico to do away with its agricultural um, subsidies. And it ended the Ejido system, which is a system of dis land distribution that took place at the, Mex at the time of the Mexican Revolution. In addition, the US could now sell their, their agricultural products, which as some of you know, are highly substitute subsidized to the tune of about 40% and dumped them in Mexico. So that uh, Mexico, which had been a net food exporter, became a heavily net food importer. And that is getting worse every year. Um, it's true to this time. And I think the statistic here is that the World Bank um, um, measured the extreme poverty rate, what they call miseria in, in Mexico, um, and it grew in, in a really short amount of time, in three years, four years, from 
um, 35% to 55% of the population. That's just a huge increase. So um, this spurred, not surprisingly, migration to the US. These were people from, from the sending states became Chiapas, Oaxaca, Puebla, and Veracruz, and they became descending states, which they had not been prior to NAFTA. And that's because of the coffee stabilization agreement um, and, and NAFTA. It just, these people, none of them could make a living or send their kids to school. So our policymakers decided in the same period of time, while NAFTA was actually being um, drafted, they decided, they knew that NAFTA would cause the um, increase in migration to the US. They don't, they don't talk about that, but they did know, in fact. And so they decided to start a program of fencing off the traditional migration routes through the main cities. And that became, um, that first one was called Operation Hold the Line through El Paso, because the Border Patrol person in El Paso, Silvestre Reyes, who's now actually a congressman, um, he theorized, and he's the sort of theoretical um, push behind um, Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Hold the Line, and the others, um, he theorized that this would p push migration out into the desert and in the mountains, and people would get be injured and die, and so they wouldn't migrate anymore. Well, you know, I think it was Janet Napolitano, of all people, who said, you can build a fence, but if you're desperate, you will someone will build the ladder one foot higher than the fence. And basically, that's what happened. Migration not only didn't stop, it increased. And you began to have people dying in the desert. So these are, these are the deaths. Um, when I was there it was from 2004, excuse me, 2004 to 2007. And we were finding bodies in the desert, um, in Mexico, now also in the US, but in Mexico, because we, I was with the border ministry there, and so we had offices on both sides of the borders and allies on both sides of the borders, and we did, um, we founded then a migrant resource center, which was kind of a hospitality center for migrants and did a lot of work with the Mexican government in trying to mitigate these deaths. Um, we uh, did water stations and a lot of other stuff, which I won't go into. But the interesting thing about this, and, and this is, first of all, you never hear that 7,000 people, over 7,000 people have died. And that's in our deserts. That doesn't count the people that actually don't make it across the border and die in Mexico. Um, but the other thing is that even though migration is at net zero, um, the lower line, are, I mean the, um, the brown there, are remains found for each 100,000 apprehensions. In, this is just Arizona. Arizona became like the funnel. Arizona became where everybody crossed until the Min Minutemen came in 2005. So Arizona's are really, now you have people dying across the whole border. And in last year, 900, and I forget the exact number, but over 900 died in, along the whole border because now people have shifted from Arizona because the enforcement there became very, very heavy and it's less heavy in Texas and New Mexico. So um, even though apprehensions are way up, the deaths are still really high. And that's because it's really, really, really difficult, and yet people are still trying to cross. Um, I have a million stories, and I don't have time here to tell them, but they're heartbreaking, really heartbreaking stories. Grandparents. And, you know, trying to reunite with their children in Philadelphia and whatnot, and almost dying in the process. 
and some dying, children trying to re reunite with parents. It is, it's a horrible situation on a human scale. And this is what we don't talk about in our narrative. We don't hear about just, you know, people, what's happening to people. The big change in our own immigration laws came in 1996. And I have to tell you, those of you who think of President Clinton as kind of a good guy, no, not. Um, he did some really bad things. And with the help of, of a Republican Congress, I will say. But um, the, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which is known as IRA-IRA, and um, the Anti-Terrorism and Death, Effective Death Penalty Act, both came in 1996. Oh, thank you. So what these did, and these, this is a big divide, because for the first time, enforcement is tied to the criminal justice system. And that is be because they saw this as a way of catching terrorists, which they knew not one terrorist actually ever has crossed the Mexican border. But they knew that um, this was a way of, of having almost like a dragnet. So what it did was it did away with, um, it, first of all, it expanded the grounds for deportation. and. Um, a whole list of crimes, which some of which were actually violations and misdemeanors, became, quote, aggravated felonies in the law, for which you could be deported mandatorily, that is, without um, a hearing, or with, okay, without a hearing. And then a whole bunch, and then another thing was, a, was, was serious inroads into due process. Because for the first time, immigration judges, if they had a person before them who had committed a crime, no matter how long ago, and again, you know, I've had personal involvement with folks who committed their crime when they were 17 and never went to jail, and you know, with some like minor drug offense or something, in the 70s, were picked up in two th after 2000. So these are a whole bunch of crimes that all of a sudden became deportable offenses. So even, and even if you hadn't served time, but even if you had served time and served whatever it was, and we're not talking here about rapists and murderers, we're talking largely about drug-related offenses, most of them not property crimes and victimless crimes. So, all of a sudden, they, the law made it impossible for you to have um, a judge that could use his or her discretion to decide whether you could stay or not. So the, the judge's hands were tied. They could not take into account um, how long you had been in the country, whether you had U.S. citizen family members, children, grandchildren, whatever, and there were plenty of grandparents picked up on this. Um, they they um, could not take into consideration an exemplary life that you'd had for 30 years after you committed your drug offense or whatever. Um, all of those things that they normally would take into account could no longer do. So that meant that deportations just climbed after 1996. Um, and the other thing was mandatory detention became, if you were picked up for one of these crimes, for the most part, so-called, for having committed, not for committing that day, but for having, then you could, would be sent, um, generally speaking, immediately to detention particularly men. So um, basically deportation becomes the point of no return because it'll also increase the bars to re-entry to um, 
established, I should say, a three-year and ten-year bar, and all the things that go into that is just too Byzantine to kind of explain here, but, uh, and, or a permanent bar. So if you were deported, forget ever, you know, rejoining your wife and family or, or husband and family, whatever. Okay. Um, under the Bush administration after 9-11, they also s established all these partnerships between local law enforcement, and that meant you know, like in New York State Police, which Lori Gertner, who's here, actually knows a lot more about than I do the details of how that's played out in the last few years. And, um, but also any local law enforcement, city police, uh, whatever, sheriffs, you know, you name it. They're all, they were all kind of enlisted in immigration enforcement. And that was through three programs, um, the CAP program, 287G, and Secure Communities. And again, I won't go into the details of these, but one of the things they do is they share if, if you're arrested, never mind if you haven't actually committed the crime, but if you're arrested, your fingerprints get sent to the Department of Homeland Security. And if you're uh, found on one of their, on their database, then you're arrested for an immigration, or detained, I should say, for an immigration offense if you're undocumented. Um, secure communities, interestingly enough, um, became a um, started out as a voluntary program, but then when a bunch of cities and states, like New York originally said they wouldn't participate, um, they turned it into a mandatory program. So it is, has been a mandatory program since, I believe, 2010, I forget the exact date. Um, and, and it's a mandatory program and it's now in 48 states. So basically this cooperation. Um, the interesting thing about this is it's kind of, these are kind of dragnets because what happens is even though um, in 2011 John Morton, who's the Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security, sent out a memo called the Morton Memo. And the Morton Memo said that people who had not committed any offenses other than entry without inspection were a low priority. And then there were other, um, other things that categorized people as low priority. Well, um, a study of the detainers, which are the, the documents that are used to, to keep people uh, until Homeland Security picks them up, it's shown that only 14% of those issued in 2012 were for people who had committed any kind of serious threat. 14% out of, you know, 100%. A lot were, uh, I, I think it's almost 50% were people who had never committed any crime at all. And then you, you've heard about, you can go to this one, it's fine, but um, they're also very much implicated in the rise in racial profiling as a, a way of um, uh, catching um, undocumented folk. Okay, this is just a, a graphic of the heavy enforcement zone around the U.S. And you can see that here where we are upstate is pretty much most of New York actually, but especially upstate is we're, we're in the heavy enforcement zone. Um, and this is the, how the cost of enforcement has gone up since IRCA, so it's 1986 to 2012. And it's actually gone down slightly in the last couple of years. Um, and I should know why that is, but I'm actually not sure. It's not for lack of trying, I know that. And under the the um, comprehensive immigration reform, so-called, it actually would go up tremendously again. These are drones they use in border enforcement, and they will, S744 is the, the comprehensive immigration reform bill that probably won't pass, but it's got, um, it, it doubles the amount of enforcement um, in, 
and the, uh, the amount spent on enforcement, basically. It doubles the number of Border Patrol. And these guys, we'd have more of those drones around. Mostly they're on the southern border now. But um, These are U.S. detention facilities. What's also grown up since then is a whole sort of what um, one book is called the American Gulag, which is the network of detention facilities. Mm -hmm. And um, the unfortunate, well, there's many unfortunate things, but one of the unfortunate things is um, the entry of private prison corporations, particularly the GEO Group and Corrections Corporation of America, into the detention business. Because, you know, they make a profit. But the problem with that, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the next couple of slides, but um, in 2000, I, I think it was 2011, maybe 2012, they, um, there was a, a, quote, bed mandate established for the first time, which meant that all 34,000 um, detention beds had to be filled. So that's why, I mean, this is an incentive. There's other incentives, but this is an incentive, you know, to criminalize um, immigrants and to, to de detain them and deport them because people are making money off it. Next. Um, some of these you've probably heard, there's 34,000 immigrants are in detention any given day. Um, and then um, these include not just immigration and customs enforcement facilities like the Batavia Detention Center in Batavia right near here, um, they also include county jails, local jails. And so in those cases, detainees who are immigrants, who many of whom are people applying for asylum, who have been persecuted and tortured and um, various, you know, extremely traumatic events in their home countries, end up in detention, sometimes in the same cell with rapists and murderers. And um, it's, it's just a horrendous situation. In addition, their problem families are torn apart when you detain one person, then the breadwinner um, is, is gone often, and the family is, becomes homeless. <coughs> Um, there are over 5,000 children who were placed in foster care in the last three years because of removal of parents. And in some cases, they're, they're, the parents' parental rights were terminated without their permission because they were deemed unfit because of being undocumented, which is just, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, when I think about it, it just makes me crazy. And so what happens is that these kids, they, they terminate their parental rights so these kids can be adopted by American families, even though they have families. So that is a particularly horrendous piece of it. But uh, I, I know some of us know families right now that are facing detention and deportation because they're not documented, even though they've been fine, upstanding citizens here for decades, some of them. Um, the uh, uh, detention also has uh, some limit terrible limitations. One is the medical care generally sucks, even though they say it doesn't. Um, uh, something like 115 people have died from medical neglect and suicide in detention facilities, and that's just in the last, um, since 2008, I believe. And then um, there are also uh, a, a lot of facilities, there are no contact visits, like in Batavia. The only way you can see your loved ones is through a plexiglass screen with a phone, just like in a, in, you know, a maximum security prison. Um, that also, um, there, there are a lot of um, problems with the food and there's a lot of um, uh, 
of abuse of people, verbal, mostly verbal, but also physical. All of these detention facilities that are ICE facilities have segregated housing units, and those are solitary confinement. And, and folks are put in them for, you know, not for terrible things. Um, so it's, it's definitely abuse. It's also lack of mental health care is a big area of medicine that's lacking. Um, <clears throat> under Obama, Obama has been just really awful uh, on immigration. Um, while he, he obviously has supported comprehensive immigration reform, he has also done the most enforcement of any president to date, including President Bush, by a lot. Um, almost, it's 1.7 million people have been deported since 2009, and that's actually only up to um, the end of 2012. So oh, 2013 will be more. Um, something around 400,000 a year are being deported. And then, uh, you know, secure communities have grown. Um, an estimated 150,000 U.S. citizen children um, have a parent who has been deported in these years. Next. You can see here the deportation graph. Um, basically, the, the earliest date, I don't know if you can see it, 1990. It was like almost, it, it was very unusual for folks to be deported. Um, and now, as you can see, it's, it's up near 400,000. And they're actually, um, even though it went down slightly um, in 2012, it's, um, uh, 2011, I'm sorry, um, it, uh, it's expected to grow again this year. And then we have the state enforcement and, you know, um, the Arizona law and the Alabama law are two that got a tremendous amount of press. But there's um, actually in six states and another 20 odd states considering these anti-immigrant laws. That zeal has kind of decreased a bit because parts of those laws were not uh, uh, upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, specifically, though, only the preemption issue, which is that the, the states have preempted federal authority. So the, the really some of the nasty things like racial profiling have not been considered. Um, but in those states, you know, studies have shown that basically immigrants have fled. And so farmers are having trouble getting workers and things like that. That's a number of border patrol from 1992 to 2011. And as, again, you can see this just huge increase um, after 2005. Border Patrol abuses, um, there are a lot of sort of less serious ones, but the, the, what's happening on the southern border is, is kind of amazing, actually. Since 2010, there have been 21 people killed, immigrants, but some U.S. citizens, actually, killed by Border Patrol. And the vast majority of those cases, they're shooting from um, people that are still in Mexico, um, but there have been cases where people have been beaten to death on the U.S. side of the border, and even Congress is now starting to notice. Because up until then, I mean, I did an investigation of a death in 2005, and they were so unusual then that, you know, they, they, it just didn't happen. It happened, but it didn't happen a lot. And all of a sudden, you're getting all these. And that is because Border Patrol has, because when you increase um, an enforcement agency so much and you need to get certain numbers, 
vetting gets a little bit less careful, training gets a little, and this is actually, this isn't speculation on my part, this has actually been proven in a study. Um, a training is less, uh, what's the word, comprehensive, and you take people that are more sort of borderline people, I guess, and, and, you, and this is the result. You get um, very many more, um, um, what's the word, use of force issues. And then the, the last couple of slides are about comprehensive immigration reform. Um, I know we would all like to think that that would be a wonderful thing, but um, the, this bill now is the worst comprehensive immigration reform bill to date. They get worse every time they get put a new one out. And in any case, I think it's very unlikely that it's going to go uh, be uh, um, voted, even voted on in the House, let alone enacted. So it's probably not going to happen. But um, again, the use of guest worker visas uh, is tremendously expanded. All of the um, issues with the 1996 laws, like the lack of due process, the use of detention and deportation, all of those things are still in the law. And, and the estimate is like between four and six million um, people will not even qualify for what's called uh, registered provisional immigrant RP, no, RPI status um, because of one thing or another. And the fines are, are very are huge, and for most poor people, um, impossible. And that, these are the, the sort of really ugly things in this. Um, it, it also uses uh, the E-Verify system, which I don't know if you know what that is, but um, it's a system using social security numbers to catch um, workers who are not qualified to work in the U.S. And the problem with it is it has a million problems. It, um, it a lot of um, LPRs, um, permanent residents and citizens get caught up in it because of name problems and things like that. So if, you know, and so using that is like using a national ID sort of thing. And it just is going to be a nightmare for employers and for immigrants. It does not address racial profiling in any way. Um, the social security benefits folks have paid in, even if they become a registered provisional immig immigrant, um, they will not be able to claim them. So, you know, it's, it's really, uh, really not a good bill. And I think, honestly, I have to say, I, I don't think legislation is going to do it. I think immigrant advocates and immigrant rights folks really need to be doing other things. I'm not saying don't lobby your congressperson. I'm just saying we need to be doing a lot of other tactics. And um, I'll just close by saying the tactics that I'm seeing that are actually getting a conversation going about some of this draconian stuff that's gone on um, are blockades of um, detention facilities, for example, um, where they're re taking people out and putting them on a bus to go to take them to an airport, a bunch of folks to deport them, and physically blockading that process. Not only gotten a lot of press, but it's also raising the conversation about why deportation is not um, something that helps us. And um, with that, I'll close. These are some suggestions what you can do to help. I have a lot of further explanations of some of these things on the table. Um, I also have a list of websites which were put on some of the chairs. 
but I, but I only have, um, I think I put out 20 copies. So if you want one and didn't get it, um, yeah. Oh, you made more? Yeah. Oh, Tom, bless you. Thank you. So thank you very much. one of my relatives who lives in California, she insists that they vote. I said, that's not possible. Right. And that, is that a myth? It is a myth. They, uh, they actually, because of all these voter fraud, um, voter ID laws in, in many states now that have happened since the end of, um, since the um, Supreme Court, um, I think I don't know, using the word shut down, that's not the exact, that's not the word I'm looking for, but the Voting Rights Act, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So now you've got a whole bunch of states, more than 20, who have enacted voter ID laws. The rationale on the part of, I would say, most Republicans that are in favor of these and groups like ALEC and all is that there's this tremendous amount of voter fraud. Every study that's been done by reputable organizations, um, and even some that that are—I mean, they're not really, they're not left-wing organizations. They're very, uh, you know, establishment like the Brookings Institute um, have found that the incidence of voter fraud, meaning somebody voting when they shouldn't have, are, is minuscule, minuscule, less than one percent less than 1.1, I mean, minuscule. I can, if you want a study, you know, I can send you one. Just write me a note, okay? All right. Grania, the slide you had with uh, the uh, picture of the Predator drone down uh, on the border, mm -hmm. that, that's a weaponized drone? Are they used as, as means of shooting at people or only surveillance? No, they're used for surveillance. They're the same animal, but they are not used for shooting people, no. Uh, Granny, what's your understanding of why Obama has, has fostered this incredible uh, increase of deportations? You know, um, there's the charitable explanation and they may be not so charitable. The charitable one is that um, it, it's politically palatable to a large number of Americans, although they're in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, if you deem deportations as criminals, you know, it's easy to say, to separate the quote, good immigrants from the bad ones, bad. And of course, the reality is a lot more complicated. And so I think that's done for political reasons mainly. It's certainly not done for safety re reasons. Um, and I, I have to think that it was his, first of all, under Bush, this started. So it wasn't as if he just kind of did this out of nowhere. Um, and some of these programs like Secure Communities and stuff actually started under Bush, um, the local enforcement programs. But um, it's really, um, as I say, that's the more charitable excl explanation is that he hoped to sell to Congress this bill, this comprehensive immigration reform bill, which actually would help some people. Um, and the trade-off was 
making sure that the right wing couldn't say he's not enforcing the immigration laws. That, that's, as I say, the charitable. Maybe the less charitable is the administration's ties in with huge corporations and I, you know, I know more actually about their ties to banking than I do to um, Corrections Corporation of America. But, but there are people, and there's certainly Congress people, who have big holdings in those companies. So again, it's the trade-off. Is we'll give you this if, you know, if we can do this. Just a minute. Oh, and then, oh, Sister Phelps. I, just to go back to that whole question about children, um, has there been any movement of people to work on behalf of children and to challenge the law on, in that respect? That's a really good question. The, the problem is it's not the federal law that needs challenging in these instances. These are state laws, state officials who then, you know, with, when somebody is deported, a parent or, or two parents, then state officials can say, well, this person can't be a fit parent because they've been deported and the other one has no resources and is homeless or whatever the situation is. But it obviously destroys the family unit. So then the state, and you tend to get this in states like Missouri, for instance, and some of these states where you have a huge right-wing narrative going on. And so it's not, I mean, New York doesn't do this, for instance, or if it does, it's relatively little. Um, it tends to happen in states where state welfare agencies will say things like, well, they're better off with an American family which is just incredible um, racism and, um, uh, what's that word? Jingo, what? <laughs> Somebody? Arrogance? Yeah, arrogant. I mean, it's hideous. It's a complete lack of, you know, it's, it's like these people aren't civilized, so therefore the child is better off with an American family. That's kind of the, the, the statement, even though they don't say those words. Um, just a little historical uh, reflections. Up until uh, the 18, oh, I'll back a little further. Uh, when we had our first Thanksgiving, uh, the meal consisted of, uh, among other things, corn and turkeys. Both of these were domesticated in Mexico and were traded north uh, to Indian tribes because in those days there were no borders. Right. And so us white folks came in and ate the corn and ate the turkeys and gradually spread out across the continent. And killed the Native Americans. Uh, yes, ah, good. I'm glad you mentioned the Native Americans because you know, Native Americans stretch from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Exactly. They don't stop at our borders. All indigenous people were here before we were and they were all in that sense Native Americans. So then up until around the 1830s, uh, there, that area that we now see along the border was still part of, of Mexico. Mexico. Right. And we gradually took it over and put up the border and locked the door. Now I want to just mention one local thing. There's of course many others, and that is that uh, some of you may have eaten at, uh, with, uh, at La Casa recently or at the uh, the place that they had first in, in the public market, me and Omar, uh, um, and they just recently, in February of last year, started a new restaurant, La Casa, uh, and in November, it turned out that the owner of the building, Elijah Wilton, who also owns Boulder Coffee Company, uh, took the building from them, is now running the restaurant. Excuse me, just a minute. Yeah, let me ask the Okay. This is it is sensitive, you're right. Yeah, I think we, we don't want to go into that. I think it's it would be difficult. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Jeff. 
Just a couple things. One on the uh, question about public assistance benefits for the slide said immigrants, but I think what you meant was undocumented. Undocumented, undocumented. yes, correct. Okay. And secondly, it was very interesting information about the criminalization and especially the fact that um, the federal laws do not criminalize uninspected people that come in, but some of these state laws are now doing so. So therefore, because the right to a, a uh, defense attorney upon an arrest is triggered by a, a criminal offense, are these states that have criminalized, like Arizona, are they now providing public defenders for people that are being arrested? It's interesting, and I'll just do this really briefly because I know the time is wasting, but um, in Arizona what they do, and this, was, this is what makes it to me Operation Streamline particularly horrendous, is that they, they're kind of like mass trials. Um, they have one public defender for, say, 20 or 30 people. And they're instructed, and you know, a lot of them don't speak English. I would say the majority of them don't because they're mostly folks that they've caught crossing the border. Um, and they um, theoretically provide translators, but I understand from people who are there now um, that the, they really do not help people understand the implications of the fact that they're pleading guilty to a criminal offense. And so that, you know, and it may be just that the public defenders are overworked. It, it, it's a lot of things. It's just the whole process is not due process. Um, so yes, they get a public defender, but it's kind of a, a mass public defender. Granny, I have a question. About the Constitution free area, so, um, the whole, yeah. uh, a lot of the United States were, was that legislation that was enacted or presidential decree or how that's, did it happen? That's a really good point. Um, in the, I'm going to probably not give you the correct answer because I don't really know for sure, but I know that in the law, there's a 25 mile zone around uh, the U.S. or the border that's considered um, within the zone that needs to be, um, you know, for example, if you're on the southern border, which is the one that I know the best, um, they, they have border patrol checkpoints and stuff. And so it's not just getting across the border, it's also within 25 miles of the border that they have these various checkpoints where you have to show your documents or you know if you don't have them then you're screwed um my understanding and actually john might be able to explain this since it's a since it's a nightclub doc a new york civil liberties union document that i got that from um or may or um john huber or john gertner um maybe you guys have a better explanation but my understanding is that it was expanded to 100 miles. Yes, John, well, thank we, you. We, we just touched on that today a little bit. Um, I believe, or at least the folks in the Genesee Valley ACLU meeting today, was that the, it's a 100 mile range, but it's 50 on each side of the border. Okay. And we were actually talking about drones which got into right. this other thing because drones now are doing a lot of the surveillance right. and um, along with this NSA security stuff, we're spying on Canada and Mexico with our drone right. flights right. trying to catch illegal people. So how much other information are we grabbing from other yeah. countries? But it's supposed to be 50 on each side of the border. Okay. According to okay. I have a related question, hyphen uh, remark. My, my memory always fails on numbers, but uh, that's supposed to be partly a joke. And, uh, uh, but in any case, 40 or 60% of the population lives within this uh, region of uh, exactly. no constitutional uh, 60%. 60%, okay, I knew it was one, I didn't know which one of those numbers was the one. It's so, 197 million plus. Yeah, so anyway, just, Feel happy about living in a constitutional government. 
Constitution, or the lack thereof. Yes, we live with it. Is the Constitution is the Center for Constitutional Rights doing anything yes. about? Yes. Yes. The Center for Constitution. The, the the there are several organizations that are really really active on challenging. Um, some of this, the detention practices, the deportation practices, the Center for Constitutional Rights, which I think I have on my list, but I may not. Um, um, na uh, the Endelon, which is the National Day Labor Organizing Network, they brought a, um, a suit in New York with uh, NYU um, Immigrant Law Clinic and a couple of other folks that was really, really, really important in 2009. And despite a great deal of stonewalling on the part of our government, the Department of Homeland Security, they were forced to um, turn over huge numbers of documents from these programs. And so that way we have actually learned a lot more than we knew before. And Endelon is interesting because most people don't know that much about them. I do because I was really familiar with them in Arizona but, and in New York. But they are doing, um, you know, one of the major Center for Constitutional Rights and Endelon are probably two of the most active in terms of bringing suits to um, reveal and counteract some of this. And Endelon also is um, asking people to participate in blockades of um, detention facilities. Now obviously if you do that you get arrested so you know you need to be educated about that you need to be prepared and everything but I'm just saying that this is happening and it's happening more and more and to me this is the part of um, advocacy that's going to actually change things because the more people read real stories about real people who are suffering because of these, the more people like us are going to stop saying, well, that one was a criminal and that one was a good person. And they'll, they'll start seeing that the criminal justice system, which itself um, overly targets people of color, obviously, if it's so closely tied to the, to the immigration enforcement system, then it's as equally unfair um, to people of color. Sylvia? Um, um, can, yeah. can, can you uh, speak a little about uh, Clinton in 96? That's when he uh, changed the welfare laws. To exactly. Um, he, he, I'll tell you, I am not, I like President Clinton, I've actually met him and talked with him. He, he's actually kind of a nice dude in person, but he did some terrible things. And among the terrible things he did was this temporary assistance for needy families, which is not the subject of tonight, so I won't go into it. Um, these immigration laws, which completely shifted the um, the direction of immigration enforcement in this country. And he also um, ended the Glass-Steagall Act, for those of you who are interested in banking issues. So these three things alone, in my view, uh, pretty much condemn him. Um, you know, he has a much better rep than he has actual legislation that he passed. Not to mention NAFTA. Hmm? Not to mention NAFTA. Oh, that. not to mention NAFTA, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any, yeah, I mean, any, are there any more questions? If not, Grania, this has been such an so informational good. education. Woo!